Hello golfers! Welcome to Golf in the Cosmos. This is episode number three. I'm Kevin Robowski, PGA Golf Professional at the KMR School of Golf. And we're here talking everything Mac O'Grady and Morad. So this is a journey exploration into the swing mechanics that a lot of Morad enthusiasts, a lot of uh, both teachers, players, professionals, have explored bits and pieces of this, maybe have had trouble connecting it through the ages. And so I'm here to sort of, uh, as a sort of a narrator of sorts, to sort of piece together some of this puzzle. Today we're gonna to be talking about positions one through four, basically address to the top of the backswing. A lot of you have had questions about this, so I thought this would be an appropriate time to cover that. I still am very passionate about having a guest on and um, I'm very strongly inclined to have this one person um, that really should kick us off in the real podcast format uh, interview. And, uh, and I'm still very optimistic that he's gonna join us, perhaps on Zoom in some format. Uh, um, I really love to in interview. I wanna keep it, his name a surprise and it'll be a mind-blowing experience, I, especially for those that have um, you know, sort of been around the Morad project since the 80s. So we'll let that go on the back burner. I'm still working on it. I can't wait to bring that. I hope it does happen. If not, then we'll keep exploring Morad. We'll have some other guests on. There's plenty of people we can talk about uh, Mac O'Grady with and Morad, so um, stay tuned for that. In the meantime, let's cover positions one through four, which can be very exasperating because it did change through time. And even for myself, I really kind of narrow it down to basically two ways that you can go to P1 to P4. Both are very valid and I think um, it's worth to explore uh, both of them. It depends a little bit on where you're at with Morad and if you want to take a more detailed analytical approach. So some people's personalities favor that and then there's basically more of a broad, a uh, little more field-based and a little more intuitive-based approach as well. And I would say that would be the earlier version, where even in the 80, 86, everything was mapped out, the sections, the motor set, the radius locks. So there were very specific uh, points that, and not only points, but also um, positions, um, also uh, degrees of, of angle movement, uh, governors, these things were, were very much part of the original Morad project, but I don't think it was taught maybe as much in, in the finer points and the details. It was a little more broader interpretation. So let's start with that a little bit and um, get people that are maybe a little bit confused, maybe thinking too much, maybe too analytical, too mechanical, too complicated, you know, all of these things kind of get associated with the Morad swing. So let's break it down to early 80s and we'll start off with the low hands that we covered in the last video and the stance. So stance was 18 uh, inches apart, right foot 10 degrees, left foot about 22 degrees, and then the low hands. So the low hands creates already a preset. Now the preset isn't this way linearly, it's more upward. So encourages both wrists to dorsiflex, right? So that's the left hand, or sorry, the, that's the low hand position. And so we have a little bit of a preset here. Um, hands are low down, which gives me almost the feeling that my wrist can cock upwards. And then from there, so that's the preset. And then from there, the hand path will go to the inside. And the hand path goes to the inside because of two reasons. One, because the body starts to rotate. So uh, left knee kicks in, left shoulder kicks in, right elbow starts to fold um, a little bit more. So the right elbow goes from about five degrees flex to about 10, from P1 to P2. So when you do that, if this represents the shaft plane, we wanna get from P1 to P2, basically up the shaft plane. So this version was low hands, hand path goes inside, right elbow flexes, and it's gonna just line up perfectly at P2. Club face is gonna point 
at right angles to the shaft plane, more or less towards the ball, right? So we're not gonna fan it open with wrist rotation, right? So no forearm, no wrist rotation at this point, okay? So this should be fairly simple. If you have low hands, it's very hard to get the club head to the inside, which is I think what most people try to avoid. At least better players hate that look where the club head is underneath the shaft plane. Right? So it's very hard to get that with low hands. In fact, you know, when you have low hands, the, the club head, if anything, tends to pick up. Right? So you see this in like, examples of Hubert Green, for example. Guys would pick it up. Johnny Miller, low hands, picked it up. But Mac is rotating early. Right? So the, you have this upward hinging and then this inward rotation, all, happen, all happening simultaneously. And so that's what's lining up P2 perfectly. Right now, in this model, this is the 86 model, this shaft does not have to trace the plane line. It basically has a, has a general orientation, and again, it kind of depended on the club. So Mac would say, with the shorter irons, the shaft can be more vertical. So it can point inside the base of the plane. Right? And that was, I think, mostly to help keep the left shoulder down. Right, so the shaft starts to get flatter like this, and then the shaft plane, the shoulder plane starts to get flatter too. So there's a relationship between flattening the shaft plane and flattening the shoulder plane. Right, so I think driver, longer clubs, um, the shaft was, should have traced the base of the plane line, but shorter irons, maybe up until about five iron, it could be a little bit more vertical, not standing straight up, but somewhere in between tracing and vertical and that would be to keep the left shoulder down and also to get the shaft more down the line at the top so down the line was um, the desired position at p4 and parallel more parallel to the ground probably driver maybe even getting a little bit past parallel you'll see mac in 86. so p1 low hands um p2 we're going little bit vertical wrist break because of the low hands and in rear rotation, right? P2 to P3 with the shorter irons, the shaft's a little more vertical, driver maybe tracing. And then P3 to P4, we finish the shoulder turn 90 degrees, more down the line, 90 degrees wrist break and dorsiflexed. So both wrists are um, cupped, right? And so the reason the cupped wrists don't open the, cl the club face is because Max got a strong grip. So he's got 45 degree rotation in the left hand and about uh, 20 in the right hand. And this is basically preventing club face rotation. So you can go ahead and do the full wrist break. You can do the full wrist cock, dorsiflex, and still keep the club face square. So the more neutral your grip gets, what will happen is when you cock the wrist, the club face opens. And this is what we see with a lot of amateur golfers, right? They hold the club too weakly in their, in their hands, more neutral, too weak. And then when they break their wrist, the club face is wide open at the top. And then their brain is making the corrections for the open face and the downswing, which is usually over the top and lack of weight shift and casting. So those are the three, th three things that the amateur, the recreational golfer suffers from because of open face. So max solution was the strong grip. Left hand rotated 45, right hand about 20. That is gonna help eliminate club face rotation and opening. And so you can cock it and dorsiflex it to get the 90 degree wrist, wrist break. And then you're down the line at the top. Um, and so that was, that was the goal. So from this angle, low hands, right? P1 to P2. Shaft is about parallel to the ground, right about outside the right thigh. So is this a short arc or a mid arc? You know, probably somewhere in between, right? Short arc would be just very sharp wrist break. So this was a little bit more the later model, right? So I would say this is kind of somewhere between short and mid, right? So the shaft's parallel to the ground. Hands are just on the outside of the right thigh, right? So start off vertical. Hand path goes inside, wrist cock upward, boom, P2, right? Then P2 to P3, 
shaft goes up maybe a little bit vertically with the shorter irons, left shoulder goes down, the shoulder turn is 45 degrees now. My left arm is 45 degrees also inside the target line, right? So that was the 86 version. P3, 45 degree shoulder turn, left arm 45 degrees inside the target line. And then P4, continue the shoulder turn to 90 degrees, left arm goes across the shoulder plane, across the shoulder line, wrist cock the full 90 degrees, club face square, down the line, boom, all systems go. Now we'll talk a little bit about the downswing in another video, but right now we're just kind of clearing up basically what I would call the two simplest methodologies from going from P1 to P4 address to the backswing. So that kind of represents most of the um, significant points of the 86 version. Um, Maybe another, one other little point which is very nice is Mac mentioned that at address, his weight is slightly on the left foot. This is 86 version and I would say this is again mostly for irons, drivers probably a little bit right. So if we put a number on it, I would say, let's say 60-40. So if your weight is 60-40 at address, right? And then P1 to P2, probably gonna start to shift to 50-50 and then P2 to P4, it's gonna stay 50-50. So we are right in the center at the top of the backswing. So weight starts off slightly left, and then when you go to P1 to P4, the weight goes to center. And the idea was you rotate on a centered point, right, a fixed axis. And uh, so that was the goal of the 86, um, you know, uh, backswing in terms of kind of minimizing weight shift, emphasizing centeredness and rotation. Um, right elbow, we might as well mention this as well. So the right elbow is in the number one position. So right elbow meaning that it's down and in. Now, um, in the later MORAD, it's a little more emphasized, but basically it's in a relaxed down and in position, not out to the side and basically we're keeping the space between the elbows uh, fairly uh, tight throughout the backswing, right? So we don't want the elbow to slip right, um, out to the side. That would, be, that would then complicate your downswing. So elbows are fairly close together, but relaxed. And um, we're gonna maintain the same distance between the elbows and the elbow will be in the down and in position. At the top, there's some, there's some space. Mac kept his arm pretty close to the side of his body. Um, so didn't, uh, didn't create a big gap at the top. In fact, in the 86 uh, method, he would swing with uh, a T or a penny under his armpit, right? Or a dime, something under his armpit to keep that connection, right? So um, he didn't fly that elbow out. Right. And so he got a lot of speed, a lot of power, keeping the right elbow close to the side of the body. Right. So that was the connection, the idea that you know, everything's in tight, the swing is lighter, the rotation can be faster. Right. You're not like overextending um, and trying to get into this wide arc. Okay, so that kind of covers most of the 86 backswing and now We'll go into sort of like a combination of 90s to 2000. And of course, I think there's many other variations to this, but this is the second model from P1 to P4 that I like, and I think is, has, some, has some value. And pretty much the stance and, and the grip are gonna be the same, but the shaft in the later models started to get more uh, leaning. So the address position, was um, hands more forward. Ball position was played a little bit more in the middle, not so much up front, which Mac did maybe in the, in the 86 model as well. So ball position, more middle, shaft, more in line with the left arm. So this will make sense for a lot of people that need some structure, need a model, a very clear model to swing by, but not so mechanical that you know it's just manipulating. 
you know, you don't want to manipulate movements during the swing. Basically, your address is setting up your is mostly the blueprint of the swing pattern, and uh, and we're going to swing in sort of uh, in in a correlated fashion to the address position. So again, stance is about the same. The only major difference is the hand position's more forward, the shaft's more leaning, and my right elbow is maybe a little more down and in. Right? It's a little more emphasis of that, um, of that position. Now this address position is going to encourage me to set the club a little bit earlier. So with my hands forward, if I start to do the backswing, there'll be a slight setting of the wrists. It's almost imperceptible in, in your conscious brain. It's just almost a rebound effect. So you'll notice guys that have this major forward press, they get like this early wrist set, right? And so we want to create that using this little bit later model, uh, more at approach. So hands are forward, shafts leaning, club is de-lofted but square, right? So de-lofted is still can be square, right? So square is just the face, uh, the alignment of the face, and the loft is just the angle. So basically, I'm gonna have a square face, D-loft, shaft leaning, hands forward, P1 to P2, it's gonna be a slightly earlier set, but mostly not because I'm manipulating the wrist, mostly it's just a little bit of a rebound from the address position, and that's gonna get the club head a little bit more up the shaft plane right away. So my right elbow is going to be a little closer to my body. And then from here, I I'm going to shut off basically all you know distal movement, which means no more elbow movement, no more wrist movement. I'm going to turn back, turn back, and just feel like my elbow and my wrist are staying wide. It almost feels like you kind of have a little bit of wrist set, a little bit of wrist cock, P1 to P2, and then from P2 to P4, you almost uncock your wrist, right? To go up the plane and also to create some space. And so this, this idea sometimes throws people way off because you know, it's, why would I cock my wrist only then to uncock your wrist going up to P4? Well, the idea is that most of the time people go back with, with a lot of speed and momentum cocks it more than you think. So in reality, I mean, pretty much, I think everybody would like to have a 90 degree wrist break. And, but a lot of times it's if you're a fast swinger, if you go back um, with, a, with a lot of flexion, you don't even feel it. It will, it will go, it will go past parallel, you'll overswing and the shaft gets in a funny position, it can bounce, a lot, a lot of bad things can happen. So um, this uncocking feel was just basically a feel to maintain the 90 degree wrist, wrist break. So it's actually more simple than you think. Also, the tempo is very, very slow. So Mac in the later models really advocated going back very slow, just pivoting the club up the plane and then right back down, right? Whereas the 86, you hinge the club up, right? Path goes inside. It's a, it's a little faster swing. So definitely more swing speed in the 86 model in the backswing, P1 to P4. Late model Mac, P1 to P4, very slow, very deliberate. Um, just getting that club exactly on the plane so that you can return it right back down the plane. Um, and of course, there's the CP, C, CF of the downswing. We'll cover that in another video. So again, if we look at it from this angle, later Mac, hands are forward, right? That's gonna make your posture maybe a little bit more rounded in the back. And then I'm gonna get that earlier wrist set because there's a little bit of that rebounding effect from the leaning shaft at address, right? So we're gonna go up this plane. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back, kind of trace it. Now I can't continue to go up the shaft plane, right? Because that's going this way, right? So now there's a shift. So the, the, you know, the elbow is gonna start coming um, up, although it's still tracing, still parallel to the shaft plane. And, you know, there's a, gonna be a, an upward shift. My left arm has to get to the shoulder plane, right? Or the, or the line or the angle of inclination of the shoulders, right? So. P1 to P2, go up this shaft plane for a blip, and then there's a shift. 
right elbow starts to get off the rib cage, left arm starts to go up towards the shoulder plane. And the angle of the shaft is still um, pointing towards the baseline. So the shaft is left at the top. Now earlier, early in 86, Mac O'Grady would have called that laid off, right? So you weather that shaft pointing to the left and on the baseline, whether that's laid off or on plane, that's uh, you, you know a, a, you know a matter of interpretation, right? But that was definitely a big shift in the Morad uh, philosophy. Eighty six, looking more down the line at the top, parallel to the target line. Uh, late model mag shaft, uh, more tracing the base of the plane line at the top P four, and of course then we have the change in the wrist position. So uh, late model Mac, already P1 to P2, Mac liked to see that left wrist starting to flatten. Now, as you went back up like this, because you're kind of more in a holding pattern, in other words, you're, you're trying to eliminate flexion, wrist flexion and elbow flexion, the wrist will want to stay, again, like that feeling of uncocked. When it's uncocked, it stays flatter. So that was also part of this, right? So I feel I'm going to have a 90 degree wrist break, but my left wrist feels flat and the shaft is also going to be more inclined, right? So 86, we're going more kind of this way and late model, we're going more that way, right? And it's, and the wrist feel, um, feel overall at the top that there's more space, which is a good feeling. And then, but then in the, in the downswing, you've got to um, close that gap and narrow that swing arc. Um, and so that's where a little more emphasis on the lag came in again. So the late model Mac uh, downswing definitely was much more um, lag based. And, um, and so um, sharpening the angle, delaying the uncocking of the wrist, that was always a, a, a part of more at both in both uh, cases, but a uh, little more emphasis on it in the late model, right? So, you know, that whether your wrist is dorsiflexed or flat, um, I think that depends on which model you choose. I wouldn't try, if you're gonna go 86 Morad, it's not designed to have a flat left wrist in the backswing. It's meant to have dorsiflexion and then vice versa. If you're going late model Mac, don't dorsiflex it, keep it flat, keep that orientation to the plane. So, um, you know, those are very important points. Uh, there's some, you know, other things Mac did late model, we mentioned it in the stance, he played from a closed stance, and then also the left shoulder went a little more down, uh, maybe more left-sided. So original Mac 86 was centered. You rotate around a fixed axis. Uh, late model Mac became more left-sided, almost loading into the left side at the top. Why? So that you can get more sort of downward compression, a little bit more hit on the ball. Um, the shot was more punchy, more downward, um, less follow through. Uh, original Mac, much more zippy, a lot more release, a lot more club hit speed. Uh, throughout the whole swing um, and yeah, probably looks uh, more powerful for sure. But um, again, if you're, if you're needing power, um, I would recommend the 86 version. Obviously, Mac hit it very far in 86. It's a faster swing, more club hit speed, um, definitely um, more emphasis on rotation and, and also with um, you know, straightening the left knee and recocking the wrists, that creates a lot of speed. So this is a little bit of a case-by-case -case basis. If, you, if, you, if power is what you're looking for, I would gravitate to 86. If consistency, if accuracy um, is, is needed and you need sort of a, a model by which to swing with that's very organized, then definitely the late model um, may be your, your preference. But you got to be careful with the late model because you can go into, you know, the rabbit hole. Um, so one thing that I can definitely recommend is, 
Again, if you want to make the late model swing a little more intuitive, you simply use a stick, right? So you maybe use like a stick that's five feet long. I've done this in other videos. You hold it about in the middle, left hand rotation 45, right hand, you know, about 20, could be even a little more, 30. And then the stick is against your belt and sticking up like this, right? So don't hold it all the way at the end. Hold it in the middle so that you feel the stick against you. So this is late model Morag, right? So you'll notice from this section, uh, section one, position one, right? You see the shaft lean. The shaft is just an extension of your left arm and the ball's in the middle. So very naturally from P1 to P2, it just wants to go like there, right? Then it's set. Then you go up, tracing the base of the plane line, keeping the angles constant, just turning, right? Turn, your, turn to 90 degrees. Right, then just basically return right back down the same way you went up with a little bit of weight shift. Right, the weight shift is going to depend on the width of your stance, holding the angle down to the bottom. Right, and then basically here is straighten the knee, uncock the wrist, boom, come right up with it. So the stick is a great way to make the late model Morad very intuitive. Of course, Mac late model, he also added you know this extra head tilt. Um, and again, that can be confusing, and I would eliminate that, preferably for me, and we will have a video on that controversy too, the head and neck tilts. So that we need a whole video to cover. But basically, these are just the suggestions I would make in terms of if you want to simplify late model Morad, it's the stick model. And then if you want to simplify the early 86 model, it's starting with the low hands, and then encouraging the hand path to go inside so you get both the vertical wrist hinge and the inward rotation from P1 to P2. And then that will also help steep in P3, down the line to P4, and then you know downswing is pretty um, automatic from there. The downswing, obviously there's some, there's some you know, confusion about that as well, um, but you know, typically, if you have it, if you have any, you could probably control maybe the initial start down, but once you start down, any thought you have, by the time you make that thought, the club's already gone. So you can't. You've got to really be careful with conscious thoughts about your downswing. Um, I always tell people your follow through can influence what's happening through the ball. So I always emphasize you know, people to really focus on their finish look, um, and that really influences what's happening at impact and your release characteristics. So that's, again, another video we can talk about, but um, that would be my take on, you know, the, the impact area and then um, how, the, uh, how the finish influences it. So I pretty much covered P1 to P4, the way that I feel late and early Mac and Morad, um, you know, in, in a simple fashion, and you know, could and should be explored. Of course, I skipped over other points because there's many, many other things there. I don't know how necessary those things are, especially in your conscious brain. You know, uh, again, emphasis on early Mac was to keep the brain in more of a rest-like state. Um, and again, relying on muscle memory to you know, uh, perform. And of course, you've got to organize the swing. And I think you, know, you have two choices here if you're gonna go more at. Obviously, you know, if you do Butch Harmon, Hank Haney, David Ledbetter, there's a, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Thousands of different swings that you can try. But I honestly think that, you know, with Mac's background in anatomy and his relationship with various doctors over the years, uh, with his research project at UCLA, with his study of yoga, um, he knows human movement and, and much more I mean, uh, literally a hundred times, a hundredfold that of a golf pro, right? 
because that is just scratching you know the surface so because mac had advanced yoga because mac was an athlete because he knew about diet because he had all these relationships with physicians and also neuroscientists you know he's really connecting a lot of the dots much more so than you know a typical golf pro i mean a go typical pro i mean it's nice to think about you know you, you know basically everything begins and ends in the brain, right? And so human performance, um, really you need to have um, a clear visual idea of what you're trying to do, a clear intellectual idea of what you're trying to do, and then you shut it off, you go through a routine, and you do it. And uh, this is the way we do um, most athletics well. And it's very hard in golf because we have all this time to think. The ball is just sitting there. And if we allow ourselves to think consciously of too many things, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna stymie performance. It's that simple. So I wanna encourage everybody to, if you're watching this video, rethink a little bit of the Morad project. It's not that complicated. It actually comes, both of these models that I suggested today from going from address to the top, are very very simple and uh, quite intuitive and it's just a matter of which one calls to you so again i thank everybody for watching um, definitely reach out preferably email if you have any questions i mean any pertinent questions i do look at the comments every now and then but if you have any real pertinent com comments or questions please email me and uh, i'm really hopeful we're going to have a super special guest on soon and so fingers crossed on that until next time aloha